So, um, all right, we are. I, I've shown you two. Um, I've shown you two FK frequency wave number migration methods. Um, the Stolt migration is the is the second one, and it's the most widely used one. Um, the problem with the Stolt migration is that uh, uh, it's um, it requires one velocity. So you got to do a bunch of, of noodling around if you want to have different velocities at different depths or different velocities at at different uh, places. And you know most commercial packages that do that have stilt migration, they have all the noodling around and they do all this smoothing to make the the noodling work, but um, it's it's not a real solution. Okay, so you know I we 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 do different things if if. You know, in our image area, velocity has has big changes. Okay, if velocity has big changes vertically only, then the um, and we're starting with zero offset data, and the zero offset data is pretty good. Okay, uh, the stack is good, or or and shows the things we want. If the uh, um, if the uh, uh, if if it's good uh, um, true zero offset data like a chirp survey. Then, um, uh, then we can we can properly and completely represent that change of velocity with depth, with by migrating with the uh, the Gazdag phase shift migration. It takes a little bit longer than uh, than the uh, the Stolt migration, but the difference in speed now only makes a difference when you when you go towards three D migrations. Okay. You can, you know, of course, you can have a 3D stack or a 3D um, zero offset survey, and uh, and that's where the data volumes get large enough. You know, you got to use the uh, the the 2D Fourier transform uh, uh, transpose tricks, the card trick, uh, and then you'll find that the gas egg migration is in 3D is much much slower than the. Uh, um, than than the uh, um, uh, than the, the 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 Fourier transform uh, uh, the FFT based Stolt migration. All right, so um, those are uh, very popular methods, um, and they're the time to use them is before you know much about velocity, just to see you know for the reflectors you do see where they where they end up uh, where's What's their proper dip? What's their proper location? Right. Remember, migration uh, takes dipping um, reflectors and it moves them up dip and steepens them. Okay. And uh, uh, so you might even want to get a feel for that in the when you're recording data in the field, and you can do that very easily with uh, these uh, migrations. Um, here's another uh, simple migration. Uh, we're on uh, notes twenty, uh, page twenty-four, um, and and uh, the migration by superposition points the way to how I actually do my most of my migrations. It points the way to handling um, uh, any velocity, I'm, yeah, any velocity variation that there is. Okay, uh, it's. Uh, uh, it's uh, the migration by superposition is like uh, uh, okay, all that work we did in the FK migrations, you know, basically figuring out how to do downward continuation. Um, the migration by superposition says, uh, um, you know, forget that uh, we're gonna we're gonna effectively control our migration, and and we're gonna concentrate on the imaging condition only. Okay. Um, and uh, we're just going to, you know, we're just going to pick up amplitudes of reflections out of the uh, um, out of the raw data, and that's going to be our uh, uh, and and the the imaging condition tells us where to pick up those amplitudes, but we're not going to do anything to those amplitudes. We're not going to put them in the Fourier domain. We're not going to we're not going to uh, do any phase shift filtering. Um, we're we're not going to do anything to those amplitudes. We just pick them up from the right place according to the imaging condition, and we plop them down on the image. That's all we do. So it's a it's like a direct migration uh, with no with no wave theory in it. Um, 
Uh, yet, uh, uh, if you take uh, the 757 class, you'll find out that actually it's uh, it's a start at a full um, elastic wave inversion of your uh, uh, of your reflection data. So, uh, the, and step one is basically a uh, migration by superposition. Amazingly enough. Um, so, um, uh, all right, what is it? Okay. Um, so we have, um, you know, whether we're looking at our, our 2D data set, which is P of X and T, or our, our model, which is our cross section, our reflectivity cross section, R of X and Z, okay, we're in either of those domains, right? Any shape you can form by addition of impulses, right? So if you're looking in the data domain, and what you're looking at is a uh, is a hyperbola, okay? Then you know, especially given that we have a certain number of seismograms, you know, at at discrete values of x, and uh, we have sampled in time at discrete values of time, every one of those seismograms, it's easy to think that you know every time sample on every seismogram is just another impulse. And so, you know, just with the discrete nature, the digitized nature of our data, we already have broken up our our hyperbola into just a a, a curve of lined up points. That's all we've got. Okay, so so impulses are all we have. You know, um, now we know the simple impulse response in both domains. Okay, so. Uh, uh, so there's a very simple method to migrate or diffract, which is just adding up impulse responses. Okay. So in the um, uh, in the data, okay, we t we uh, go to a certain uh, a certain seismogram, a certain trace in our two D zero offset data set, and we're on a uh, we're on a certain um, we're on a certain um, uh, we're at a certain time. Right, and this time that I'm showing you here happens. This impulse right here happens to be uh, right on a diffraction hyperbola. Okay, so imagine that that everywhere in this data set, the amplitudes are zero, above and below the hyperbola. Okay, and on the diffraction hyperbola, the amplitudes are are non-zero. Okay, and and you know think all right, these points I picked along here, those are the only places where the where there's any amplitude in the data set, okay. So, so, so let me ask you here: what what should you get, okay? Um, you know, what 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 in the model did this diffraction hyperbola come from? You know, if you think about, you know, what what in a cross section should give you a you know one single diffraction hyperbola, what would it be? Or another way of asking the question is. What would this diffraction hyperbola in the data migrate into? It's just a point. Yeah. So, so this diffraction hyperbola should come from one point reflector or point diffractor in the in the cross section. Okay. So, uh, uh, and that's what's going to happen. Actually, the process is <clears throat> we take this point here, and this is one of the few non-zero points in the whole data set. Right. Everywhere you know that's white in this in this data set. It's zero amplitude, right? So we're we're going to ignore those. So we're going to go to a place where there's some amplitude, right? Like right this spot right here. Okay. What's the impulse response of uh, uh, of migration to one point? Um, I went over that. Uh, I don't know. It's probably it's like three weeks ago now. It's ridiculous. Um, the impulse response is a semicircle, right? So and and the semicircle. Is uh, you know is 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 basically uh, uh, centered at the time depth of that uh, um, of that point. So here's here is the semicircle. Okay, there's a semicircle that belongs to that point. That's the impulse response of that point. Okay, let's go to the other side. Okay, this this point over here, this this semicircle here. Is the impulse response of migration to that one point? Okay, and and notice that those two uh, semicircles are going to intersect somewhere. 
Okay, and then uh, you know this this uh, this point up here at the top of the diffraction hyperbola has a semicircle actually, which I'm not showing. Well, that's kind of silly. There's a semicircle in here, right? And that intersects at the same place. Okay, and these ones on the sides, right? That semicircle also intersects. This point here becomes that semicircle. It also intersects. They all intersect at the same place. Okay. Now, if you uh, if you imagine uh, that you know in the seismogram here, right? Most seismograms have a positive swing and a negative swing. Okay, and um, and and the uh, um, so uh, you know maybe we're tracing the positive swings here, right? And so these these positive semicircles are going to in intersect and reinforce each other, you know, like by a factor of, of five here, uh, and maybe uh, uh, you know a factor of a million once we've added all the traces in, right? At that at that one point, okay, and these other you know these other semicircles they're just spreading out the amplitude of that of that one of each of their points, right, and uh, uh, and so everywhere everywhere but at the spot, right, the amplitude is weak in the model, okay, it's not zero but it's weak. <clears throat> now maybe just behind this semicircle there's the negative swing, right, and so we would have a negative semicircle. Right underneath, right, and all these all these positives and negatives that are weak out away from the point where they're summing up, they're going to be very weak, and in fact, a lot of negatives will cancel out a lot of positives. Okay, they'll add up to to about zero. But here, you know, at the proper point, you know, the positives are all going to add up here, and then just below it, the negatives will all add up, and we'll get that that point. Okay, that'll that'll be really clear. So it's also clear that you know if we have just one data trace, right? We just have one impulse response, and that's all we're going to get. There'll be no way of narrowing it down. And the more points along this hyperbola that we that we add up, the more data we have to to migrate, you know, the better the reinforcement will be, and the better will be the cancellation of the of the uh, the smiling tails of the semicircles. Okay. So so that's. You know that's actually uh, how I accomplish most of my migrations. I just lift up the amplitude, you know, whatever it is, positive or negative, and I spread it out along the semicircle. Okay, um, and we can go. We can do the. We can go do the opposite. The uh, inverse process, right? Let's say, uh, and you'll see why, right? Let's say uh, in the model space. Okay, now the model space is on the left. The data space is on the right. Okay. Uh, the chirp sections on the right, the uh, cross sections on the uh, on the left. In the model space, I have a semicircle, and that's sampled, you know, by uh, uh, at, at discrete points. Each one, you know, so this point has a uh, uh, well, let's say, let's say this point here, okay, has a has an impulse response in the data space to diffraction, which is this hyperbola. Okay, and so does this one. That's over here. You know, this one is over here, and all of these hyperbola are going to reinforce each other at this one point, right? Because the impulse response of diffraction to a mirror is um, is a uh, is a point. Okay, now that's just you know that's for illustration. Uh, uh, you know. Well, now, now we do think we have some of these, uh, uh, you know, segments of semicircles uh, actually in the ground, like under Hawthorne, um, and that's a that's that's kind of a first for us. So that's actually how those were were migrated. Okay, so uh, uh, this is uh, you know it's, this is really simple to implement, and and just to let you know, I never uh, I never. I never implement it uh, on uh, with using input-based loops. I always implement it using output-based loops. So what I do is I I'm, I'm looping through all the samples in the model space. Say if I'm doing migration, I'm looping through all the samples of the model space because that's the that's the output. And I'll say, okay, this point here, you know, <clears throat> where 
if if uh, if that's a, a reflector, where is its where is its diffraction? Okay, so so uh, you know basically I cast the uh, the time of the diffraction and I add up all of the uh, all of the amplitude I find along that that you know the point I'm considering along its diffract uh, along its diffraction path I add up all the amplitudes I find. And if there really is a diffraction there, then um, um, then you know I'll be reinforcing amplitudes. If there really isn't a diffraction there, then you know I'll I'll be adding up positives and negatives and positives and negatives and positives and negatives, and it'll average out to be zero or or very small. So um, uh, that's how I how I actually do it. But this is the way to uh, conceptualize it from the uh, from the input. Um, okay, so so uh, uh, and, and what you know what is the imaging condition, right? So the the uh, um, the downward continuation is no more than just grabbing the amplitudes. Okay, I didn't I, I didn't I didn't really know this when I wrote these notes, so it's not in here. The downward continuation is just adding up the amplitudes, no more than that. The imaging condition. Is is how when you have a point here, you know, in the model, how you know it's the equation you use to describe the shape and the location of the of the hyperbola, right? That's just that that's just that equation that we saw when I first described the impulse response, okay? That that describes you know it's the equation for the hyperbola, and that involves the velocity, right? So that's how the velocity comes into it. That means that that um, you know. No matter uh, and that imaging condition, then you know it, all I have to do is figure out what what time am I going to find this this diffraction from this point here if it's a reflecting point. Okay, what time what time am I going to find that? At what times and distances am I going to find that that diffraction? So that means as long as you can like do ray tracing and you have if you have good knowledge of your velocities, you can do you know you can use as fancy a method as you like. And all you're trying to get is the travel times, you know, from the from the uh, from the source to the uh, uh, to this reflecting point. Which, since it's a trial reflecting point, you know exactly where it is, and then back to the receiver. You know, so you're just casting rays through the model space, and if you have uh, your velocity well controlled, well, that's how that's how Optum uh, uh, does their. Uh, their migrations in geothermal areas. The first thing they do is they they get a, they make a good velocity model, and then uh, and then they can cast these uh, imaging conditions from any any possible reflecting point in the section. Okay, and and it's not that much harder to do it in three D as well. All you need is the travel time, the which is the imaging condition. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, uh, you know that's that's. Our second and our third and probably our most important uh, migration technique, because it's the one that has the most future. All right, now all of these, all three methods are, uh, you know, if we if we want to make a, you know, we had a a, a family tree of, of time series. We also have a family tree of migrations, right? You can do, <coughs> you know, I've described migrations that use. Uh, uh, Fourier domain downward continuation for uh, 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 Fourier domain uh, 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 filtering for the downward continuation. Um, we're describing migrations that use uh, uh, this, the explosion, exploding reflector model to get the imaging condition. Okay, so those are all those are all pretty uh, 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 direct, but that's how we're, we can categorize our migrations. You know, how are we doing the downward continuation? And what's our imaging condition? How do we get our imaging condition? Okay, so we can have a whole family tree of migrations too. The three migrations I've shown you belong to a category of migrations called wide-angle migrations. Okay, you know that there's no restriction here, right? In this superposition migration, there's really no restriction on the dip of the reflector, right? Here in the model space, we can have any dip. By having by being able to get an impulse in the model space, a, a point diffractor, that point diffractor has all dips in the same place, right? It's got a horizontal dip, it's got a vertical dip, 
It's got all, all directions, right? <clears throat> that point diffractor is, uh, has, all, has all possible dips. So, so remember, for under the exploding reflector model, and I drew this on the board yesterday, the, uh, the dip angle is the angle that the, is the same as the, as the angle of propagation. Of the of the wave, zero dip, you got zero angle of propagation. You know, ninety degree dip, you have ninety degree angle of propagation, at least in 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 uh, constant velocity. So so migrations that can handle ninety degree dips, they can also you know they they are they are using um, wave propagation angles of ninety degrees, so they're called wide angle migrations. Okay, and and of course. Um, <clears throat> You know, we already saw that that Stolt migration, for instance, through the Jacobian factor, you know, doesn't handle ninety degree dips very well. It won't show them very well at all. Um, uh, in fact, uh, you know, strictly, it, w it won't show them at all. Um, but the uh, uh, the the you know, technically, it's it's possible. Okay, to get ninety degree dip, um, and uh, uh, and and the the gas egg migration, the phase shift migration, the Stolt migration, and the the uh, uh, the superposition migration, they all um, uh, they all can can deal with ninety degree dip. Okay, now if you have uh, uh, if you really do have 90 degree dipping reflectors, your stack data will not show it. Okay, your uh, 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 you know the Stolt migration won't handle it. Uh, it's going to be really hard just to record uh, you know a signal from the, that 90 degree dipping reflector uh, in the field. So there's a lot of problems. Okay, so most data sets are really good at showing. Um, uh, reflectors that are going to end up with a structural dip of maybe up to 30 degrees. Beyond 30 degrees, you know that's considered wide angle. That's considered high dip. Uh, and um, you know, in the in the classic stratigraphic um, exploration for oil and gas, okay, you don't have a lot of uh, it, it, that. Doesn't depend much. On, on getting those those steeply dipping uh, structures, you want to see the stratigraphy, which is generally you know has a dip of no more than five degrees, you know, and and we're we're presenting our our uh, you know we're interpreting seismic uh, uh, um, seismic stratigraphy and uh, seismic sequences, you know that that involve dips of maybe less than one degree, but we plot it in in you know at large vertical exaggeration so we can. Interpret the stratigraphy. Okay, so so we don't necessarily need, uh, you know, to do a lot of good work. We don't necessarily need wide angle migration. You know, we could we could think of migration methods that are not wide angle. You know, if they make the uh, the downward continuation easier, or if they uh, if they make it easier for us to to handle some velocity variations. You know, or easier to analyze velocity. Okay, um, so. Um, uh, and, and these wide angle migrations have some have some problems. Okay, um, and and another another way of expressing uh, uh, and and we can do you know so so we're going to have some motivation here for coming up with a with non wide angle migrations. All right, uh, another way of expressing the uh, you know what wide angle uh, means is that uh, we're observing the entire semicircular dispersion relation. This blue underlined thing here. Okay, um, you know, on the on the sides of the of the semicircle where it hits the kx axis, that's where we're we're going to see that ninety degree wave propagation. Okay, so um, uh, and and of course, you know, the actual acoustic wave equation is propagating waves in all directions. You know, so physically we're we're okay. All right, the physics of the problem is is is. Is pretty well represented. Uh, trouble is that that uh, except for you know marine surveys, but on on land, zero offset data is doesn't exist. We have to make a stack. 
okay, and and those wide angle, uh, uh, you know, those those reflections, those wide angle reflections from near uh, steeply dipping uh, um, uh, structures, they get destroyed by the stacking process. Because the stacking process actually assumes zero dip. Dip. So that's a that's a uh, that's kind of a tautology we've built up. You know, we have a stacking process that only you know, is only valid for zero dip, and then we put it through. We took we take the result of stacking. We put it through a migration, which which is a a, a non op. It's a no op for for uh, zero dipping uh, reflectors. So that's that's kind of that's kind of uh, and and here's where it's starting to hurt us. And then uh, you know, if we're going to make any progress uh, imaging geothermal reservoirs in in Nevada, uh, we've got to we've got to you know, go after imaging those those steeply dipping reflectors. Okay, uh, everything we've developed so far is in two D, and uh, you know, there's a lot of three D effects that will confuse our our uh, wide angle migrations. Um, you know, for instance, if our section is slightly off the uh, dip direction, then uh, then you know what is the apparent dip we'll see? Well, it may not be quite what you expect, okay, um, and that that can be a problem. the um, The other problem is comes with spatial aliasing. Uh, the wide angle um, waves that are propagating, you know, at a near horizontal direction at ninety degrees from vertical, okay, those have those have the largest ray parameter. Or the largest, um, uh, the largest slowness. Okay, um, they have the least apparent velocity, and those are the ones that are going to be spatially aliased. So we may find that because of the way we had to set up our survey and the fact that we didn't have twenty thousand channels to put out every ten centimeters. Okay, um, our, our, even if we did record a reflection from uh, a steeply dipping structure. It's spatially aliased, okay, and um, uh, you know. So for uh, you know, kind of uh, geothermal and oil reservoir depths, if we uh, if we want to get uh, um, if we want to see those reflections up to 100 hertz for some decent um, you know lateral and vertical uh, resolution, um, you know we're going to need. Uh, we're going to need to cover uh, kilometers of territory with a delta x of two meters or one meter, uh, and now you know that's being done more often these days. But that is hellishly expensive. Okay, um, so you you only do it when you have to, uh, and and so a lot of our data sets that we're working with don't have these. Uh, you know the 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 steeply dipping uh, structures are aliased out. Okay, so we'd have trouble with them anyway. Um, then the other problem is, especially in Nevada, is that you know velocity variations in X, you know, like at the edge of basins, uh, are are terrible, and none of these none of these uh, methods can handle that. Uh, there are ways, you know, like I said, with the Stolt migration, you'll find that you can enter any bizarre velocity model, and it will try it, but it, ain't, it it's it's not going to get it right with the Stolt migration, okay? Because the Stolt migration is built on constant velocity. Okay, the other thing is that that uh, you know a if you have a steeply dipping, dipping structure at reservoir depth, you've got to be way far away to see it as a as a reflection. Okay, and so it's going to have a large travel time, you know, much larger than the travel time for a a reflector, a horizontal reflector that's at that same depth, uh, which kind of has the minimum travel time. So uh, you know you're always going to be fighting noise. So here's the, these are motivations for uh, why the uh, uh, why the the wide angle migrations, the FK migration, and the this the simple superposition migration I explained so far, why those migrations uh, might not produce good results. Okay. Um, on uh, especially on steeply dipping structures. Okay, now the summation methods. <coughs> there are some advantages. For instance, uh, irregular spacing or doing a, a survey along a, a, a curved road 
you know, where you're, you're, you're not keeping to a two-dimensional uh, uh, path at all, the summation methods can handle that pretty easily. Okay? Um, and, and I've also adapted summation methods a long time ago, and everybody does it now, to, um, uh, to velocity as, as a function of, uh, of x and z and y. Okay? Um, so those are the, that, as, a, as I said, those are the methods that have the most future and can handle the worst cases. Um, so we're going to hear from summation methods again. In fact, you may have already seen uh, summation methods referred to as Kirchhoff migration. Okay. Um, and remember that Kirchhoff has two H's. <clears throat> um, now the phase shift method is uh, is reasonably fast and it correctly handles velocities of function of depth, and its salt migration is fast enough that it's easy to use in the field, and and uh, you know since you only have to put in one velocity, that's only one value to get wrong, right? <laughs> so uh, so it it you can sometimes you can use it for velocity analysis, uh, sometimes. Um, uh, you know, it's easy to apply to a to a large data set. Um, you know, and you can apply it in the field to a large data set. Don't even have to transmit the data back home. Um, and so it's uh, 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 it, it's it's still used. Okay. All right. So we have some practical imaging methods, and uh, I want to go back and see why. You know the, these these imaging methods, especially the summation migration, they're so simple. You know why do they work at all? Okay, and we've got to explore some some aspects of why they uh, <clears throat> uh, why they why they work at all. Okay, so all right, we've got this set of of assumptions that we're observing here. We've got zero offset receivers. Source and receivers are coincident. Uh, so it's a certain kind of survey, like a chirp survey. Uh, we're looking at vertical component data, okay. Uh, we're looking at linear elastic waves, so we, you know, we're going to have P waves and S waves and surface waves, but um, but we're looking at vertical components at least uh, of of ground motion, uh, and then we also have impulsive vertical sources, all right. So like hammering on the ground, you know, that's the that's the prototype. Um, so we can do a lot of useful surveys uh, under the under those conditions. Now, linear elastic medium, um, uh, you know, if if and 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 in everything I do, at least so far, I'm ignoring anisotropy, I'm ignoring um, um, uh, intrinsic attenuation. Okay, so my linear elastic medium, instead of being uh, um, uh, a matrix of 21 values. Okay, and there are some symmetries, so maybe you could boil it down to nine. Okay, um, you know, and, I, and so I don't have uh, uh, I don't have uh, viscoelasticity. I've got no loss of, of wave energy to heat, um, and uh, that's not too hard to assume, especially for a chirp survey in, in water, um, and uh, and even on land, you know. I don't have any anisotropy, so so all I've all I've got are three medium parameters. I've got rho, lambda, mu. Rho is the density. Lambda is the Lomé uh, lambda parameter, which is kind of like the uh, 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 it's 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 most closely related to the compressibility. You know, for a modulus that you that you might uh, uh, you might be more familiar with, and then uh, the Lomé mu parameter is the rigidity. It's the the uh, the shear modulus. Okay, so we've got three moduli here: modulus of of uh, of, uh, of mass, uh, modulus of uh, uh, of expansion, sort of, and uh, and modulus of, of shear. Okay, so uh, uh, with with that simple um, uh, with that simplification, we see elastic waves traveling at uh, uh, at more than two velocities, but here are the two main velocities. There's the p velocity, which uh, and here's where the lambda comes into play. Uh, uh, and you may know the p velocity is alpha. It's the square root of the quantity uh, lambda plus two mu divided by rho, 
And the shear velocity is the other velocity, also known as beta, which is the square root of, of mu over rho. Okay. So at least the shear, the shear uh, waves are, are mainly propagating according to the uh, rigidity modulus. Okay. Um, so that's one way of dividing up the waves. Here's, a, here's another way, okay? linear waves. And so we can divide them up any way we like. And here's a, here's a very useful way. Uh, these diagrams uh, showing you know, rays of energy going from a source to a receiver, <coughs> uh, you could also think of them as Feynman diagrams because they're showing transmission of energy or, or, or flights of particles, you know, basically transmission of energy whether by wave or particle, I mean they're the same thing, right? Uh, and they're also showing interactions. Okay, so uh, you know here's a fine. Well, here's actually two Feynman diagrams in one, because it's showing two different kinds of uh, of energy arriving. We have a wave which starts out at the source, uh, converts to a refracting head wave at the uh, at a refractor, and then. Um, well, actually, con converts to a refraction at the uh, at the refractor, and then on its way up to the receiver, converts to a, a head wave. Okay, back into the uh, the lower velocity uh, medium. Here's a here's a second Feynman diagram, which uh, shows the reflection, right? Which is basically uh, energy transmitted through the refractor, and then hitting and converting to a reflection at a at a reflector at an interface. And then transmitting again through the refractor uh, back up to the receiver. Okay, so three Feynman diagrams here for three different kinds of waves. One direct one one of these is a is a direct wave, right? There's no interactions here, and then two different kinds of interacting waves. Okay. Now now this would all be very theoretical, but you know this is at least how I like to think of what's going on. When I'm looking at a seismic section and trying to figure out where the waves are coming from, or what you know, trying to identify each wave, you know, I, I, I need to be I need to think about these Feynman diagrams to figure it out. Okay, so let's define you know, continuing on this line of thought, let's define a direct wave as one that experiences between the source and receiver uh, only these things: geometric spreading. Uh, we could put attenuation back in here, you know, um, uh, viscoelastic attenuation, and then ray bending according to Snell's law, okay, with no energy loss, all right. And there's Snell's law, just for your your reference, you know, we got an interface between two media. Uh, there's uh, a medium with uh, uh, v zero and a medium with v one, okay, and and. Uh, all of these factors here, well, not attenuation, but we could we could say that it, it does. All these fact, all of these effects depend only on the velocity. Okay, so that's that's category one of the of the waves, um, or, or this way this method of splitting waves up. The other the other category, category two, are interacting waves, and I'd better talk about those when we meet tomorrow. <coughs>